Ooh, recording in progress. Oh, there he is. He's in. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Yanov. <laughs> Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Lockhart. Welcome to another episode of Consultants Saying Things. Today, it's just Phil and I, and we're talking about, you know, uh, I don't know whether to call it work-life balance. It's not really because it's not about putting your work and your life in, a, in, in tension with each other. It's about gaining coherence around making sure that your, your work and your life uh, have meaning and have value and are sort of moving in the right direction. Um, and this is something I know, you know, that a lot of people are have been thinking about and struggle with. And certainly in the consulting industry, it is a hot topic, right? Of how do I, how do I bring purpose and meaning to my life when, you know, I'm spending a hundred hours a week, um, you know, in hotel lobbies on my laptop and doing all this sort of stuff. So I think it's a really interesting question um, and, and topic. So uh, thanks for joining me, Phil. Yeah, I think this is a, this is important. And I think that for people, they Again, what we're talking about is how do I get coherence in this? And if we're looking for evidence of this, you know, we talk about the quiet quitting, then there's the out loud quitting, and then there's the you need to show up at work and I'm not going to show up at work. Basically, you know, people got disillusioned with their jobs in a lot of ways. And I think for some of them, they don't know whether they were disillusioned with their job before COVID or after COVID or the whole combined thing. But I think this is a fantastic time for us to think about what is the meaning of my work? What do I think work is designed to do for me? And what is the meaning of my life? And how do the two of those things come together? And are they in fact supporting one another? And if they're not, you know, what are the steps I can take to fix that? I mean, it's almost theological at a certain point, right? It's like, um, and I, I think, you know, Larry Joya talks about this a lot, right? On LinkedIn and, and whatnot, which is, you know, his whole thing is like work-life balance doesn't exist. If you try to balance, you're, you're going to fail because one is always going to try to demand 100% of the time, basically, right? And so you're, you're, you're going to drive yourself crazy. And so I, I believe what he says is, maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting it wrong or interpreting it wrong. But I think he, what he's saying is like you've got to get you got to get the two things aligned so that you don't have to balance them between them, right? You are doing the things that you love and and that fulfills you. But I think that's a challenge for a lot of people. It's easy to say if you're already there, right? But no, if, right, and that's the thing. So all I'm, you know, in I feel like my role is to help people ask the questions of themselves. Are these things coherent? I'm not looking for balance. I'm looking for coherence. Right. You know, is one serving the other and, and do they reinforce each other? And if they don't, you know, what do you want to do about it? I mean, you can't say, listen, this is not the way it's going to be. I'm going to be a coal miner. This is the life I'm going to lead. I'm, this is going to be a terrible. My day job is going to be terrible. It is going to shorten my life, but I'm going to have a great time when I'm out of the mind. I mean, that could be an answer. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, uh, the other thing I think is, you know, it, what what we think we want to do at the age of 18 or the age of 26 or the age of 35 or whatever, it, it, those are different things, right? We change and we evolve. And so getting on this track, like I, I look, you know, you think about it now, like the average career is what, like three years or whatever it is, right? You look back to like these folks that worked like in the same office, in the same job for 20 years, right? And it's like, oh my God, no wonder people died so early. I mean, I would, I'd kill myself, right? So I, like, it's like, how do you go through life identifying sort of those inflection points when you are changing and things are changing so that you can adjust what you do for work to align with, with who you are? Because who you are is going to... Okay, it doesn't fundamentally change, but it does sort of alter, right? What your priorities are. If you get married, you have kids, right? That changes sort of what your your focus is. And you know, if you get to a certain point in life where it's like, um, you know, you're valuing um, what is it, leisure <laughs> over 
over, maybe not over, but you're valuing leisure more and more and more, right? Um, that's going to adjust what your priorities are for work, I think. I, I don't know. I, I don't think a lot no, of right. I mean, it, sometimes it. we're it's, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's impact, yeah. sometimes it's social integration, right? I mean, I think it can be a variety of things. And I think you're right on. I think we mostly think about this wrong. I think most people, in fact, let me say it's even, I think the problem is worse than that, Chris. And I think, by the way, this could be a topic for us to come back to, right? Yeah. I think for, for in the consulting space, I think the real sin for most people, and, and I, I mean, I, I want to freight it morally just like that, is that we don't think about it at all. We just go, oh, I think I'm just here to make some moolah so that I can go vacation in the nice place that I want to be or whatever, however that might be. But the thing is, we are so we've spent so little time thinking about how we architect what we spend most of our waking hours doing um, because we think I'm um, I'm just living for retirement or I'm living for the weekend. You know, I mean, yeah, there's living there for memes the everywhere. I, I think there's, that that's a real thing. I, I mean, I've right. said for a lot of years, I work to live, right? Right. Um, and that's how, in my mind, that's the work-life balance, right? I'm, I'm not balancing. I'm doing the one thing. So I only, the only reason, not maybe not, okay, 90% of the reason I'm doing the one thing is to be able to do the other thing, right? And right. I know a lot of people that don't understand that, don't think that way, think like, oh, well, that, that's, a, that's indicative of no work ethic and like all this sort of stuff. And it's like, no, no, you don't understand. I will kill myself with work if that means that I can do the thing I want to do, <laughs> right? which is which yeah. work. It's the other thing. And people say, yeah. oh, you need to align those two things so that the thing that you want to do is the work. It's like, no, no, no. The thing I want to do is sit on the beach over here uh, with the water lapping up and, and you know, drink pina coladas and, and beer all day. That's what I want to do. That's not a job. At least I haven't found one that pays I don't know who will pay me to do that, right? If, without having the name Kardashian, I don't know anybody who will pay me to do that. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it's, um, I don't know. Whoa. The dog, the dog wants in on, on the conversation. Oh, it actually got through that time? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which dog is that? Is there only one dog now? Today, there's only one dog. The other one's at the groomer. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah, actually that could be a whole topic right there. Right. I mean, I know we've talked about, I think it was over a year ago, we talked about mental health with some experts. We've talked about mental health on our own with our own experiences before we've talked about work-life balance. I think it was a whole episode called work-life balance. Um, uh, yeah, this mean, isn't it. This is crafting your work life. I, I agree. Designing uh, your work life. Yeah. Architect. I love that you said architecting. You're architecting right. your situation. I think that's really critical because people, I think people are stuck in this. They're trying to balance or they're trying to align or they're trying to do all these. Well, they without a rubric. They're doing it without a rubric. You know, right. am I happy in this moment? <laughs> oh, shit. That's no. hedonism at its very best. But <sighs> as thoughtless as you're being about it, it doesn't even really qualify as thoughtful. That's a quandary that a lot of people are in right now, I think. I, 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 yes, I believe, I think that's absolutely true. I think there's something there. You know, and I don't, I don't know if it's always like this, if it's something about the timing, if it's related to COVID still like this lingering after effect of like, you know, you got to work, you got to work, you, you, you know, I, I, I don't know. Right. And it's like, I feel it more acutely now than maybe I've ever felt it. Right. Which is, you know, I just want to go live on an island at this point, right? And it's like, I, I can't be the only one. And I mean, there are people with... You're not the first person today to tell me that, right? I mean, I just had someone tell me this story this morning. No, what I really want to do is drink beer with my friends, you yeah. know, and, and hang out at the beach, playing games, drinking beer with my friends. If I could do those all at once, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, but I mean, you, have, you still, I, mean, I don't know if it's an age thing, maybe because you still have people, you know, primarily younger people that say like, oh, I want to make a difference. I want to make change. I want to do all this. Sort of and I remember being that guy, right? I remember like wanting to change the world and do all these amazing things. And then I don't know if life just beats it out of you or you beat it out of yourself or your priorities change or the environment you're in changes or all of those things change. But like, I'm not that guy anymore, right? <laughs> I'm content to sit back and watch the world change around me. And that's, I don't know if that's entirely healthy, um, but, you know, 
maybe, you know, I've been reading, I've been reading the emperor's handbook again. Right. So like, there's some things that are outside my control that uh, I'm not going to worry over. Right. Because if you do, I don't know where that ends up. I don't think it's a healthy place anyway. Yeah, no. I, well, I mean, that's certainly right. I think this is one of the reasons I would just like to have more of these conversations asking more people, right? I think it helps us figure out why we are might be in the spot we're in if we can ask people from different environments how they feel about it, right? Because I feel wow. like, you know, a young person at a very different stage in their career, I would like to hear what their answers were. But I'm going to tell you, I asked somebody who is very much... Uh, I don't want to give away details because I mean, you could guess this person. I don't want you to do that. But I mean, but in this case, right? So I asked a young person working for a big consulting firm, mm -hmm. what the purpose, I mean, ask them about the purpose of their work. And I got answers. I asked them the purpose of their life and they locked up. Right. And I was like, that's confusing. Yeah. Why are you here? And it's like, no, no. I mean, you know, I know you have feelings about the the god and the universe and all of that i mean what do you think your purpose is on earth mm. go i can give you i can give you that answer i know what it well, is for you. maybe right. you i mean and I'm, I'm glad that you can't and i would be happy to hear it but the point in this moment was here is a young person in the family formation phase of their life that was just lost yeah. no answer no idea well and uh, listen i I would have to ha I know, I know my, I have peers that are in exactly the same place and they're my age, right? So mm -hmm. this is something that I think transcends age and I think transcends the type of company you work for. I don't, I mean, is, you know, is, is, is the, is the end result of plenty and um, no worrying about the bomb or whatever, right? I mean, we have, I mean, if you, if you look historically, right, we have everything we could want, right? by by and large most of us do and it's like what are our worries our worries are you know not whether we're going to eat tomorrow although a lot of people do worry about that but i think the middle class by and large is not worried about whether they're going to eat tomorrow they're worried about like you know why youtube tv doesn't work as fast on on one tv as it does on the other or like just meaningless kinds of like we, we and, and i think struggle gives purpose to life right and if you if you don't have struggle like real struggle which a lot of people do i'm not discounting that right but like by and large the middle class doesn't have like struggle in the historical context we're not worried about the landowner going to come over and chop our hand off right and that sort of thing um without that I think, what do you what what are you striving for leisure i guess i guess that's is that the objective i don't know yeah uh, well i really like that idea that that you know struggle is formative for us, right? And that that's kind of, and it helps us assign purpose and all the rest. Um, I think there's a, there's a deeper theme there. I mean, that's, that's useful to contemplate, right? And, you know, we always, you know, as career advice, you know, I've always looked at young people and said, hey, find the person with high quality problems, problems that are right. both interesting to solve that people have resources to solve and that naturally align with your skill set right those are great problems to, great places to go solve problems and then you want to be around people that you like so i get that bit you know but to your point the nature of the problems that people are you know, and look at it. We can look at kids today and like you said, it could be, oh my God, my YouTube doesn't work or my DNS server isn't right or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, oh, we've had some family formation stuff and our parents were worried about their brothers going to war and being killed. And before that, they were worried about being killed by war and famine and pestilence. I mean, you know, our problems it, for us, we're here, we're very privileged Um how does that form us, right? We, you know, right. none of us, you know, I've been reading uh, Simone Weil. And, you know, here's a woman who starved herself to death in solidarity for her countrymen who had gone to war, right? I mean, right. she's like, she she literally, according to her, the present doctor, when she died, basically she wouldn't have died if she hadn't starved herself. And she refused to eat more than she knew that the the soldiers on the front line were eating. That was a a, a line she'd drawn in the sand for herself, right? I, I, it's just so fascinating. 
Um, I anyway. don't know that story, but that's that's astonishing, right? If you think about the level of commitment it takes to do that, I know what it's like to do intermittent fasting. And you know, after you know, I was trying to do a sixty hour this week, and after 48, 44 hours, I was like, my mind wasn't working anymore, right? And so yeah. it's like, you know, we watch like Naked and Afraid and things like that on Discovery Channel, where these people do, like eat like you know a hundred calories a week and crazy stuff like that and lose thirty pounds. I mean. Forget the toll it takes on your body, right? The toll it takes on your mind. And, and I think, you know, in a similar way to depriving your mind of protein and all the fats and all the stuff that you get from food, depriving it of some of these other things, right, that we've been talking about, struggle, um, aspirations, um, I don't know, what, what, what a value system, like all of, all of that bit, right, a purpose, right? If you don't have that, I think it's probably just as debilitating. Maybe that's why our IQ is dropped as a as a society, right? Is we we don't have things to think about, <laughs> so it's like you know the brain, re- right? We don't really have to work as hard as we did. We don't have to work our minds as hard as we had in the before. You know, our, like you said, the struggle, our environment is not as threatening as it was before. Right? Well, I want to go back know, to one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Fine. I don't really want to cut you off, but I want to hear you answer the question. What is the purpose of your life? You said you had an answer. It felt rich and full, like you had something in your head. And I don't mean I'm not evaluating on a thing. It's like it was something you had thought about. So why are you here? I would like to know. Yeah. Um, before I answer that, I want to I want to tease up like a, a corollary here. Right. Which is, you know, in the same way that the human body and physique has changed over the millennia, because we no, have, no longer have to run after woolly mammoths and things and hunt our food and all this sort of stuff. And the sedentary lifestyle that we get and the obesity and all that sort of stuff, the change in the physical nature of our bodies, there's got to be a corresponding mental change to a lack of challenges, right? Well, cranial capacity is reduced over time. I mean, that's, this is also documented. Our yeah. brains are smaller than they were. Huh. Man, that, that's a sad, that, you know, flash forward a couple thousand years. What, what does it look like? Right? Anyway, to answer your question, why am I here? Um, I exist to propagate my genetic material, right? I exist to have, to exist, right? That, that's how I view I mean, my mission on the planet. My reason, the etra, right, is... Um, to have kids and and have them have kids and raise all of them in a secure uh, environment and provide for all of them. That's how I view my mission, right? Right. So that's informed, like, well, you know, why do you, why do you, you know, if you looked at my LinkedIn profile, why do you have so many consulting jobs over the years? It's like, because I, I, I'm not keyed in on necessarily what's best for the career. I'm keyed in on like, what is the best thing at that time for the family? So when the kids were younger, right? Um, I traveled a lot and yeah, you miss some formative things, right? You do. But I also feel like um, I, I get much, I, I, my importance to the family of being present increased as they got older, right? In other words, mm. when they get into their preteens and their teens, certainly, and you know, they needed me more, right? And so right. that corresponded with going from a five day to a four day to a three day travel work week. Right. right. Um, and I, I like so those are the reasons I make those changes. That that's my answer to that question. Right. And it, maybe it has all kinds of um, you know, uh mental chemical reasons why I think that. Uh, maybe some of them are spiritual. Like I, I don't know exactly, but that's sort of how I feel about about life. Um yeah. Yeah, no. I don't know. What's I like your, that. I, you must I like have that an whole... answer for this. You must well, have an answer for this. I must. Um I <laughs> I like that, by the way. And I like the whole, I mean, I, that's, you're so closely aligned to the biological imperative, right? It's I mean, immortality, it's like, Phil. It's immortality. That's right. I'm, I'm casting the gift that is my thinking into future generations <laughs> via my I, DNA. I'm permanently encoding it into the like, landscape. I, 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 you know, some people might call that narcissism, right? But it's like, no, I, I want It's a to- gift. It's my gift to you and to future generations. More Lockhart's. <laughs> I bequeath. I bequeath my progeny. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Um, What's yeah. your? I, What's well, this? I mean, you know, I am. 
I am here. I'm running an experiment. I am here to run this experiment to see, can I be a good human being? And, uh, you know, I ended up kind of in a scattered in chaos. I was born in chaos and I've tried to figure this out running my own sets of experiments. So I'm here to do well for me and those folks that are around me. So in this case, it is my family. You know, I am trying to raise a couple of kids and help them to be good adults and help them figure their way through the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I've at least replaced myself um, and, you know, to have an impact on others so they can figure out Right. what it is, why they're here. And I think if I can have that impact, I've done good and help other people do good, then I've done my thing, right? Yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. I I think that's, yeah, I, I think that's aligned, right? With, by the way, I think that's what a lot of people really, truly fundamentally believe or would answer. I mean, the, the self-interest can kind of sometimes get in the way, right? The the hedonism part. I'm here to have a good time <laughs> kind of thing. I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. A good time. Right. Um, yeah, well, that can get in the way, right? But it's like, oh, you know, I think at the end of it, it's like, you know, we're social animals. We want to be with people. We want to, you know, be in partnerships and be in families and be in groups and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, uh, and so that the individualistic primal urge um, to better yourself or better your position or do things that make you happy, well, they also have a positive side effect to the to to the mission, right? If the mission is to build a a a protective bubble around your unit, right, um, your family unit, your whatever it is, your group unit. Right. All of those things that you are thinking like, well, this is for me to have a good time. Well, that helps in general. That, that was that's my way of justifying selfishness. How do you like that? I'm sure that I'm sure there's some psychologist that would look into that and say, what? The, well, well, what well, that's, the I mean, that's the time? selfish gene, right? I uh-huh. mean, yeah, I, I think there's there that you are not alone philosophically in thinking that's how you're going to create your life or what other people might be thinking about how they create their lives. Right. Um yeah, I don't think that's solitary. I mean, I think in quite frankly, my interest in this is to help people figure out what it is they do believe. And so when I ask questions about this, I'm not challenging if what they're believing is no, right or wrong. No, I'm challenging how Socratic deeply they're method. committed. Yeah, I really want it to be Socratic method. I want I am trying to get you not if I can, is there aporia in this, right? Can I take you to uncertainty? If I can, that means you're not very committed to this. And yeah. how do you figure that answer out? Because I want you to have a life that you're committed to, because that is deeply rewarding, right? When you ask those questions, and I'm asking this just um of your your studying and stoicism and the Socratic method and other things, when you are asking those questions of people to get them to think about the answers and stuff related to it. Do you ever find it challenging to remove the element of leading the witness from that questioning, but re- like challenging to remove a, a belief out of the, out of the question itself? Is that ever a problem? Because, you know, when you, when you, you could ask somebody like, you know, why do you think that? Um, but you could also, you know, kind of lead them in a direction that is of your thinking or or something, right? What's you certainly can. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm generally trying to avoid that. So, in fact, I you know, I always never say, "Why do you think that?" I will say, "How did you come to believe that?" And what I'm trying to get you at is, what are the sources? What did we you know yeah. when you when you came to believe that this was true? What did you use as reference material for that? Yeah, where did that data come from? Are you sure that's correct? So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I just want you to think about it. I mean, I think there's utility in thinking about it. I want my thinking to be mm. rigorous, right? Um, and I want to, I want to hang around with people that are thoughtful about their thinking. Do you find that that people frequently, or always, or infrequently, or never are able to answer the question, "How did you come to believe that?" Because I would hazard to guess that there's a significant percentage of the population that wouldn't even understand that question, let alone how to answer it, right? 
Yeah, it's not everybody. You can't get everybody and you can't get everybody to the same level of depth. So it just depends on who you're talking about. Uh, and some folks are downright argumentative when they realize that there's some neurotic underpinning to their thinking, right? Um, you know, they, that they hold a belief with no basis, no real basis. And the problem is the belief is so important to them, so identifying that it's hard to give up. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it's uh, quite rewarding, that, like I said, just to let them think about it. And again, my job, I, don't, I don't see it as my job to like break somebody. <laughs> I just, I mean, and I you, you were back. the code red. <laughs> well, I mean, because there are times, right? There are conversations, there are certain professional conversations where I do see it's my job is to break your thinking about something. Now, I will generally put you back together when I'm done, but I will break you in the moment because I want you to have that moment of realization. Oh my right. God, I'm holding this point of view and this is unfounded. Right? Or, or it's emotional, right? Um, it is, that's that right. It's got no rational basis. That's what I mean by unfounded, mm -hmm. right? So it could be all emotional, no oh, rational basis. I, mean, I don't want to be that. Well, I'm sure a psychologist could help us with this, right? But like, maybe a psychiatrist should, should help us with it. But um, I'm thinking like, just because, it, just because something is in, purely based in emotion, does that discount its validity? I mean, feelings. I mean, feel, it could people, be right, right? I could say I love a beautiful sky. I mean, I could have a, you know, a, a, a preferential claim, right? I really love blue skies. You know, and I hear people do this all the time. You know, you ask, how are you feeling? Oh, it's just such a beautiful day out. And I, and I really want to ask, is it? <laughs> is it? I mean, okay. How did you, you know, come to believe that? I mean, you know, like, oh, it's raining. And yeah, it, I mean, I get the it's raining part, but the mm -hmm. it's raining and it makes me sad. Well, how, how did that happen? Yeah. I mean, it's what raining. Is it? Raining and it makes me happy. I know. It could have been. I'm a farmer. I know I'm trying to raise avocados. I need all the rain I can get, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think people think about that very much, but you know, maybe it, they're just, it gives you comfort. So, but to your question, sometimes I think you can have an emotionally held belief, um, not super rational, not something that is founded in a bunch of facts, but it can be quite useful for you, functional rather than dysfunctional, right? So uh, as humans, right, we, we I believe that it's quite possible that as humans, we are pre-programmed to appreciate neoteny, right? Uh, large eyes and babies, right? And we, things that look like babies. And we're programmed to do that because taking care of babies is kind of important to making our genes go forward, right? This thing that you've already expressed as an interest of your own, right? But if, if we we're but that's kind of emotional at some level. Oh, aren't babies so cute? Aren't puppies so cute? Okay, they're cute. I believe you that, and that's probably emotionally and not rational. But we also can recognize at some level we're just probably pre-programmed for that, and it's okay. Yeah. I don't need to. I don't need to think deeply and question that idea. How did you come to believe that baby was cute? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's an ugly ass baby. Let's just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, honestly, frequently they are, right? So there you go. Sometimes they are. My brother, my, my baby brother, was a tongs baby. There's a word for this, I don't know, but you know, they've been, oh my God, that was an ugly ass baby. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And when I say ugly ass, it wasn't that, it was his head. His head was like, oh my, like, oh my God, that's terrible. He doesn't listen to podcasts, does he? Oh my God. Well, it's funny. So now my brother's. Well, I don't know. He was born in 1970. How old that makes him. But, you know, it's kind of funny. He said he doesn't have hair now. You know, he's lost his hair. But if you put your hand over his head, you can still feel the creases between the plates in his head. You know, oh, and like goodness. you or me, you put your hand on your head, your head feels smooth, right? Uh, underneath him, you can feel the plates where they joined with each other. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't know how any of that has to, like, you know, has to do with um you know, living a full life or anything like that right but i mean i think those are all sort of critical questions and i think a lot of people are asking them i mean i, I know certainly in my as i mentioned in my peer group in within my own company there are plenty of people asking like what the f am i doing and why right and i 
And it's difficult, I think, when you're midlife and you can't answer those questions or you don't have satisfactory answers to those questions. Maybe it's satisfying answers to those questions. You know, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, as you point out, they're not alone. And not only that, but they possibly, you know, got to some point in their career. And then COVID just shook people up. You know, it was three years of someone grabbing you by the shoulders and just boom, 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 boom and saying, this isn't the real world. And right. uh, what is the real world? And I think some people are just don't have a clear answer to that or what they should be building in this moment. What are they making? What are they producing? You know, what kind of life are they building? Yeah, I, I think there's another aspect of it, too, which is, you know, and if I do all of those things that, you know, I've grown up believing that I should do the work ethic, the work hard, the have values, the have a passion, the all, you know, all of that stuff. Does any of it matter? Right. Because like, and I think COVID was part of that shaking, as you mentioned, right? Because during that time period, long held beliefs and values of our society were upended. Right. Absolutely. You know, um, And so it's like, I struggle all my life and it can just be gone in an instant like that. Like, I don't know. Something about that, I think, is really disconcerting for a lot of people. But anyway. Yeah. Here's the thing. You know, when you, you talk to somebody and let's say we can have this kind of conversation, we're comfortable, we're in a good spot, we're good, right? And you say, you know, don't forget that when someone asked the Buddha, what is the meaning of life? And he held up a flower. The point of his conversation was, the point of the flower was, there is no meaning. It's just what you bring to it, right? right. It could be just this, wow. and maybe, and 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 if you were if you weren't that person, you know, most people don't want to have that conversation. They don't right. even want to think down the path that life is without yeah. meaning, right? They they are busily clinging onto something else, giving them meaning for their life, right? Uh, but most people just don't want to have that conversation. But you get shaken like that, and you thought the meaning was, I show up for work, I make money, I get to take that money home, I get to have the life I want, I get to live in the house I want, I get to raise the kids my way, blah, 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 and my kids will be fine. And then you get that shaken by COVID, you know, your kids have mental health issues because of the way they're being kept home from school. And, you know, all all of the in your family structure gets Mm -hmm. stressed because you're all in a house for three years straight. I mean, you know, it's oh, my God, we're all running the Mars biosphere experiment in our house. Yeah. yeah, I think you know that could that did shake a lot of people up and it will it will rattle through for years to come particularly among those kids. Yeah. I mean, you can I don't think you have to cite studies. I think you can arguably say that you know education during that that time period was substandard, right? Was well, substandard that's, that's terrible. We here's the thing: we kept them home because we wanted to keep them alive. Right. But what we didn't realize is we were giving delivering them an inferior education, and we were impacting their mental health in ways yeah. we just didn't understand. We yeah. did the best that we could with what we had at the time, but we also there was the unexpected outcome of the emotional stress that was left on them at that time. Yeah. Well, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. So you know, it's like all the nice. unexpected consequences of, <laughs> yeah. of things. Um, okay. Well, cool. I don't know if this is what we set out to talk about. <laughs> well, you came, you asked for, well, you did say you wanted to come up with some sort of intro to this thing. Did you have anything in mind about that? Uh, well, I don't know. I might just jettison that and use this. I mean, this is a oh. decent conversation, I think. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm kind of running through that stuff and uh, running through in mastermind the idea of life. I'm not, it's not really, I'm not trying to get the life work balance. I'm trying to answer the question Is your work fulfilling your life purpose? Are those two meshing? Are you getting coherence between it? Um, the conversations have been really spectacular. I mean, like there are things like you think are really easy and you hit it and like, oh my God, people are stuck on why they're on this planet and what their purpose is and what they're trying to get done. It's like, okay, I didn't think this is the question we were going to be stuck on. I thought it was going to be something else, but it was really great conversation. And I've come up with some techniques that I love. 
Awesome. That was amazing, Phil. Thanks for joining me today. Um, you know, when it comes to coherence, um, I, you know, I'm not at home. I'm <laughs> at the beach, like co- aligning my my uh, my value system with <laughs> with uh, with work, uh, I guess. But, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's an important topic and I'm, I'm glad you were able to join me um, sort of last minute. Um, and, you know, I think it's uh, it's something that I think has a lot of tendrils, right, that we can explore uh, over the next, you know, rest of the year kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to talking about it. Thanks for making this space work. I mean, you're on vacation for God's sake, and here we are talking just the same. So that's a commitment to the audience. It's a commitment to the conversation, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And hopefully we can be helpful, and we want to be helpful in the future as well. Working on my tan. Um, (laughs) Thanks, Phil. I'm Chris Lockhart. We will see everyone next time. Bye. Yeah, man.